Ông quý cho Ông Rung dục rap a cam to, kachem la gan tay bt sam la ca. Hay nơi tay nít, tam ca bp, nơi bàn krung tuk, sam la ca. Da. Ay kasa kung luk bok 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 sạ bị nhá nâng đời sạ bị bị nằm mốc nằm nàng đầm đằng rọt của ní nơi sạ mà cả cặp ngày tìm mà phải buồn đó ngày tìm mà phải phải lấy khai bị cho nay năm bị còn đọc bảy làm chi sạ mà cả lúc đầu ăn sáng là đi cả bị thành lập hiệp vật tầm miền vật tầm miền bọc cô lại nằm phía kia đều như vậy có chưa cho luôn được không phải chúng ta cả sạ mà cả đi xong cuộc chiến đấu chiến nước lòng sạ mà cả như thế này ní là cuộc bị kia đằng ao miền vật tầm miền đây lại chuẩn cho cho lục nôn chía miền bắc miền tây tổ chức cung cung cầu xa xăm nhà cá tam đại sản bài đảm bảo ông cùng nhà làm nông bông nên đại sản mua hai sáu cặp hiệp lục xã mỹ tv toàn bộ đầm nàng chiết đầm nàng đam đang rót viên ní lục bị ấn bàn chùm đang một thá lục đang mau dịch bà sáu bà cun bà bà cun thì chiều bữa tối tới này một năm đầu bị thiệt hại chuyển từ cầm mây tv các cái đầy lục nồi chí ông nhìn ra xong mình chơi như lục mây tv hạt tiệt với kén các cái chỗ nơi ngay bờ khoa thì buôn khai cát cát đá bên to pì dương nhôm chụp thiên ông nhìn ra là tập bốn bàn bạc ca bạc xã mạc ca xâm lập ngày nụ hơi lục ạ tia về kén tia mì tùy ăn trái chiết cà phê đầy lục kêu dùng phón bàn trái đôi cầm hăng một ở chỗ phù dương chụp thiên ông chụp mình chụp ra một tổ một mì tùy rụng đi nơi một tổ ông quỳ đời mình cầu cho nơi về một thiên ông dùng ra nâng chạc cọm xây chết này ông dùng ra chạc chanh phì bẩn tục xạm nạc ca ạ cà phê gia bẹp đi cư chi ạ cà phê gia mùi đại thị lệ chốt nơi cọm cầm rất bọt cà thang xong đá nơi cờ rúc ca cờ rúc với chi chỉ viện đại chi mỹ tử vi nền nghĩa trời bậc căn dục chụp mục tô la ca ní rư nơi ai tô la ca xin xin tiết tổng vừa bài ní cư chi ưu tế ho mình lọ mùi chụp mùa mạng nà mỹ tử vi chụp nôn khói xin xin tiết lũ mỹ tử vi cà phê kê rung đi miền lẹ cà nạ khá ơ cực tôm nâng miền chế rất rung khan đòn cách chăm nà ca nê tệ vi thi xa mạng ca nơi chụp mục xa xây xa xây vực rùm bà chi chi vẹn rô bạc quát cơ đồ chi nơi chụp mục xa thiên ạ chun ông Trọp tạm vị thiên xàm thường bởi mũi này vị thiên tây khăn nông Cười cười chọc Et si je souhaite répondre, monsieur le président Alo bà thiên nhằm xôm cho lại tốt Pour dire que J'estime que c'est Bà này bà này Xôm chơi cười chọc Je certainement le moment de m'exprimer, le lieu et l'endroit puisque ça n'est pas ici. Đại đạo bằng hai đời cầm Sa Phri Nha nâng Sa Mệt Vi nó mốc đồng nàng đầm đang rõ trong phần này Xong chương lục đồng nàng Sa Phri Nha Thank you Mr. President, good morning to you and the bench council I wanted to raise just a preliminary issue regarding a list of documents that the Nguyen Chea team circulated last night I believe rather than raise this objection 
uh, when, uh, in the middle of the proceedings. A number of the uh, documents listed were trial transcript, transcripts from the trial proceedings. Uh, it appears that the Moon Chea team, as part of, pres part of its presentation, uh, intends to do something that none of us have done before, which is read testimony of witnesses from the trial proceedings. Now, I'm not sure, certain of the use that they intend to make of trial testimony from witnesses. Uh, if it is simply context or introduction to a document they are presenting, we may not have any objection. But if they intend to use this proceeding to present witness testimony that they believe is relevant, I believe that goes outside the scope of the intended purpose of these proceedings, which is to discuss documentary evidence that the parties believe are relevant. Uh, so I raise that issue now because there are a number of documents on the list, and uh, I believe it's appropriate uh, to, uh, uh, to raise this objection now rather than in the middle of the proceedings. Good morning, Mr. President. Um, if I may briefly reply, there are some uh, trial transcripts uh, in our documents, uh, list of documents. Uh, it is merely uh, being used by me today to provide context uh, in the sense of, um, of the probative value of the documents being presented. It's, uh, it gives a background uh, to our argument. Um, in which we are challenging the probative value raised in those documents. So it's uh, certainly not the idea to present uh, closing arguments, as it were, just purely background context. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Your Honours, good morning, Council. Mr. President, today uh, we will offer new GF response to the document presentations given by the co-prosecutors and the civil parties which we heard in this uh, courtroom the week before last. As the Chamber is aware, those presentations concern two broad topics. The five so-called criminal policies of the joint criminal enterprise charged in the closing order and the role of our client in democratic Kampuchea. We, my colleague uh, Sonarun and myself, we will respond to both parts of the presentation today and tomorrow morning. I will begin with the discussion of the five alleged <coughs> criminal policies and a brief general discussion of Nunchi's role. We anticipate, Mr. President, that part of our response will take most of today's hearing. Um, my Cambodian colleague, Son Rue, will then speak about Nunchia's role in the greater detail. And both uh, he and I have some general comments about the quality, reliability, and authenticity of the evidence presented before the chamber. Finally, uh, Nunchia himself will use the last hour of our allocated time to make his statement. We anticipate that that this will happen during the second half of uh, tomorrow morning's session. Mr. President, I feel that it is necessary that I make some uh, opening comments about the scope of this trial. Of course, the Chamber is familiar with our position uh, about this. We stated in objections during the co-prosecutors and civil parties' documents presentations. We stated that. The Chamber may also be aware that we have since filed 
an addendum uh, to an outstanding appeal with the Supreme Court chamber. Our submissions speak before both chambers, the Lord Chamber and the Supreme Court chamber are based on the fundamental separation which the chamber established at the beginning of this trial. That separation is between evidence of the existence of the alleged criminal policies of democratic Cambodia, which is admissible, and their implementation, which is, in our view, inadmissible. I think it is clear that both the co-prosecutors and the civil parties have strayed frequently into questions of implementation and therefore into areas beyond the scope of this trial. Indeed, the prosecution's position was not that they weren't doing that. Their position was that they uh, were allowed to do that. And they were very explicit in that regard. And I refer you, Mr. President, Your Honours, to the transcript of June 26, 2013, pages where the prosecution made that uh, very same argument. And needless to say, we disagree strongly with that view. We think it's essential to Nguyen Chia's right to a fair trial that this chamber is assigned zero weight and zero probative value to any of this documentary evidence. During the hearing on June 26, the chamber rejected our objections to the presentation of these documents. You held that we would have an opportunity to make submissions on relevance and probative value in our response. With respect, Mr. President, but that ruling is not a response to our objection. And there are two reasons for that. First, this chamber has already held that we are not entitled to make objections concerning admissibility at these hearings. Relevance is a question of admissibility. And we fear that notwithstanding the chamber's most recent ruling, that we are allowed to contest relevant in our response, we will ultimately, ultimately be told as the Chamber has told us many times, the document presentations hearing are only for probative value. And these documents will end up within the pool of evidence that the Chamber relies on. There needs to be a clear and bright line exclusion of these documents, which means that, in our view, they should not have been presented to begin with. Second, Mr. President, relevance is not the issue. If the evidence presented by the prosecution is not admissible because it's irrelevant, it's inadmissible because this chamber has excluded, excluded it in the severance order. Those are two very different things. Last week, the co-prosecutors argued that evidence on the ground, lower down the line, is relevant to show that the policy existed. That is a log logical enough proposition, and we don't agree, disagree with it. In fact, as we will show later, the facts on the ground as to the supposed execution of lone old soldiers support Nguyen position that no such policy existed. But the Chamber has clearly and repeatedly excluded implementation evidence outside the scope of case 002-01 from live testimony. It has called no witnesses. It has prohibited parties from questioning witnesses except for experts or where relevant to structure. In our submission, Mr. President, the Chamber may not apply one strict standard to the admission of live evidence and a second, much looser standard in admitting documentary evidence. And in considering whether documentary evidence may be considered by the Chamber, in this case, case 002-01, it must therefore ask the following question. Would a question about this documentary evidence Excuse me. Would a question about this evidence be permitted during live testimony? If the answer is no, the document must be accorded zero weight by the chamber. And we will, of course, uh, over the course of our response, identify for the chamber evidence presented by the co-prosecutors and civil parties, which ought to be disregarded for this very reason. 
Mr. President, this is our legal objection to the evidence of implementation. These are the legal reasons why that documentary evidence is inadmissible. But of course, underneath the legal question, this one rooted in the facts of this case. And it is a question that is fundamental to the allegations against our client. It is fundamental to Nunchia's defense against those allegations. And it is fundamental to the way this tribunal thinks about the nature of Nunchia's responsibility for what happened in the Democratic Mr. President, Your Honor, as the Chamber is aware, Nunchia does not deny the seniority of his role in Democratic Kampuchea. He does not deny that he was involved in formulating the policies of Democratic Kampuchea. But he does deny that those policies were intended to cause the commission of crimes. Um, it is exactly known to you to claim that if lower level cadres committed crimes, they committed those crimes in defiance of the orders of the party center. And we submit that the evidence amply supports Nunchia's position. The evidence is overwhelming that criminal acts in the democratic Kampuchea were committed by local cadres acting on their own without instruction. The evidence is overwhelming that criminal conduct very widely across Cambodia and dependent on the whims of local leaders. That is why we are so insistent that where policies outside the scope of case 002-01 are issued, the Chamber consider no evidence of implementation. The Chamber cannot seriously conclude that we have had an adequate opportunity to show that the facts on the ground in cooperatives and security centers deviated from the CPK's centrally directed policies. For that reason, Mr. President, we ask that in evaluating the evidence placed before you, the documentary evidence, you pay the closest attention to what was said by the party center. If you focus carefully on what was said, you will find that the Communist Party of Kampuchea had no intention to commit criminal acts. The Communist Party of Kampuchea intended to implement the socialist revolution in Cambodia. I would like to quote something the, cross, the co prosecutors recently said in the filing to the Supreme Court Chamber that was in document E284 slash 4 slash 3. It was in fact the co prosecutors' response to our appeal against this Chamber's decision to renew severance of the closing order. The co prosecutors said the following, and I quote The co prosecutors submit that this is not a political trial in which the accused are being prosecuted because they were communists, socialists, or revolutionaries. End of quote. Mr. President, we would submit that the co prosecutors' presentation demonstrates Every document in the presentation which truly concerned CPK policy was about the general political goals of the revolution. None of these documents instruct, assume, or intend the commission of criminal acts. Now, Mr. President, with that in mind, allow us to proceed to discuss each of these alleged policies one at a time. And with respect to all five policies, we will show that the prosecution's key documents systematically fail to show any criminal intent on the part of the party center. We will ask the Chamber to recall that the prosecution's presentations reflect their selection of the very best documents they could find after years of investigation. And we will submit that this fact shows convincingly that the party centre had no criminal intent. 
ແລະមិនមានការចំណាយឲ្យប្រព្រឹត្តអង្គការសម្រាប់ទេហើយទាក់ទងក្នុងគោលនយោបាយទីដែលស្ថិតនៅក្នុងវិស័យលោកពីម
that some books book is different from the short or opinion. Sambat claims to be describing things he was told by Nietzsche. But it too should be given no, no to little weight by his chamber. That Sambat says that this book was based on a mix of interviews with our clients, a manuscript given to Ted Sambat by and Ted Sambat's own conclusions. But in most excerpts, quoted by the prosecution, it is impossible to determine which of these sources constitute the basis for Sambat's statements. None of the original interviews are before the chamber. The manuscript New Chia gave to Ted Sambat is not on the case file. Instead, the chamber is being asked by the prosecution to rely on a summary woven together by some Wall Street Journal reporter and Ted Sambat and package for a commercial sale. That book, therefore, is inherently unreliable. And if the chamber believed that Ted Sambat was in possession of important evidence, it could have summoned him to appear. Nguyen-Chia defense asked the chamber to summon him, the co-prosecutors asked the chamber to summon him at least twice, and the, cha the chamber decided that his testimony was not important enough to hear life at trial. And it should not now conclude that his unauthenticated book contains reliable and self-incriminating statements from Nguyen-Chia. Mr. President, your Honours, I will now turn to the co-prosecutor's claim that the CPK had a policy to, to quote the prosecution, eliminate through the use of violence all perceived enemies of the CPK. And I will discuss the co-prosecutor's documents one at a time. We won't discuss all of them, but we will discuss most of them. Our discussion, Mr. President, Your Honours, will show that those documents are consistent with our clients' long-held convictions about his role in Democratic Kampuchea. We will show that those documents reflect no plan or intent to commit criminal acts. We will show that the language the prosecution seeks to rely on are not literal instructions to attack people, but political arguments against oppressive systems and forces. We will show that those documents are only about the CPK's most general of political goals. And we will show that these goals are legitimate, that on one level they reflect the politics of every state in the world. And the first two documents the co-prosecutors presented were excerpts from books by Philip Short and Tetsembat, Ted I just mentioned. Those are documents numbers E3-9 and E52.2, respectively. Now, these are maybe not the most important documents in the prosecution's presentation, but the use to which the prosecution seeks to put them demands comment. The prosecution cites these books for the description that each offers of the literature that the future leaders of the CPK read as young men and women in the late 1940s. The prosecution is seeking to lay a foundation for what happened between 1975 and 1979 by identifying the books that students were reading 30 years earlier. Books that millions of people read every year. Books on which millions more have founded their political ideologies. And this evidence, Mr. President, is part of the prosecution's effort to tell a simple and convenient story about a small group of people who became obsessed with some ideas and used them to destroy a country. But of course, the story is much more complicated. 
So this evidence of short and subot is of zero relevance and of zero probative value to the facts under consideration in this trial. The evidence is also objectionable because of the claims that the authors, and especially Mr. Short, makes, they make in connection with them. While Philip Short is good enough to concede that the student's readings cannot, quote, of itself be blamed for what would happen later, he does claim that they were a, quote, uh, they were a, quote, formative he claims that learning of Stalin's precepts, quote, marked indelibly the thinking of the future revolutionaries. Now, these claims made almost 60 years after the fact by a person with no grounding in Cambodian politics or culture about what these specific people were thinking at a specific time uh, are, with all respect, uh, outrageous. They are entitled to zero probative value. They are also a reflection of, of the way in which Mr. Short formulates his conclusions, which the Chamber ought to consider in assessing his evidence more generally. <laughs> the next document um, the prosecution presented was a September 1977 issue of Revolutionary Flag. This document number is E3-11. And I would like to make a general comment about this first document, because this is going to come up over and over as we look at these documents here today. I have to say, Mr. President, that when we went back and looked at the prosecution's analysis of these documents and compared them to the documents themselves, we were, and I have to say that, quite appalled. We were appalled by the way in which the prosecution and I use that word carefully, but I, the, the way in which the prosecution manipulated these documents. They quoted selectively. They skipped portions that were inconsistent with their narrow and prejudicial view of the accused. And they did not endeavor to give this chamber anything resembling a truthful or accurate interpretation of these documents. Uh, this is a civil law. System, Mr. President, where there ought to be some kind of obligation on the part of the to see themselves as more than a mere party seeking to win the case. They are supposed to the office of the court. But especially with these revolutionary flags, what they did was pick and choose the quotes they wanted the to in such a way as to actively distort the meaning of these documents. And we think, Mr. President, that's very unfortunate. Let us look at this first document carefully, because the prosecution quoted from it extensively. The first quote the prosecution used was at ERN English 0048-6227. Khmer 000631338 and French 0049284. And the language was, and I quote, the mission of national revolution meant attacking and driving out imperialism to liberate the country. End of quote. We agree 100% and suppose, or at least hope, that the prosecution is not trying to find anything unlawful in it. Indeed, in this regard, the CPK should be applauded for their, general, for their genuine desire to liberate Cambodia. Then the prosecution quoted language about the classes in Cambodia and the contradictions between them. That was at ERN English. Uh, 0048 628 Khmer 0006318 French 0049815 At page 37 into 38 of the draft transcript, I won't uh, repeat the whole quote. You can see it, but the gist of it was 
uh, that there are many different contradictions between the, between the classes. I'll quote one sentence which was, I quote, the contradictions were complex and much entangled. End of quote. Now, by itself, that language would make you think that the CPK saw Cambodian society as complex, that they were not trying to blindly set one class against the other. But to try to dispel that impression, the, the prosecution quoted two other statements further down in the same page. The first was, I quote, it was from the landowners that the peasants suffered the worst, the most varied and most direct oppression. Thus, 85% of the population the peasants were in contradiction with the exploiting class that exploited them directly, the landowners. End of quote. And the second uh, quote was, and I quote again, this contradiction was a life and death contradiction. This was a profound contradiction in Kampuchean society, one which impacted 85% of the population. It was for this reason that the first party Congress defined this contradiction as an antagonistic contradiction. This being the case, how should this contradiction be resolved? The peasants had to be whipped up to struggle and fight uh, against the exploiting class, uh, the furious landowners, uh, end of quote. So the, the prosecution, prosecution is inviting this chamber to conclude that the CPK saw the 85% as being in a life and death contradiction with the rest of the population. However, from the very next sentence, the document states as follows, and I quote again, that had to be the general solution. But to win, the peasants had to gather up one another to be on their side. Our concrete experience had clearly shown that once we succeeded in mobilizing 85% of the people, the rest would follow, except for a small minority who would not go along. This is what we set as the mission of democratic revolution. By democratic revolution, we mean the liberation of the people. Concretely, it is the liberation of the 85% majority of the people who are the peasant class. To liberate the peasants who make up 85% of the population is to liberate all the people at one block. Among the 15% remaining, the great majority would follow the masses of the peasantry who form a powerful revolutionary force. End of quote. So what is language that the prosecution deliberately and consciously admitted clarifies that in making revolution the peasants and working classes are not expected to be in conflict with the rest of society. Instead, they are expected to join forces with the vast majority of the population against a tiny group of truly ruling class landowner elites. Next, Mr. President, the prosecution quoted an excerpt from ERN English 0048628230, and French 0039281816. In that excerpt, the document states, quote, Spiritual leaders of the exploiting classes disseminated inf information to bury these contradictions. The belief that bad and good deeds from another life resulted in the present conditions served to deceive the peasants and prevent them from seeing the contradictions. Now, that, of course, is straightforward and very orthodox ideology. Religion is the opiate of the masses. And you could probably find 10,000 clinical studies professors in Western universities still today who say exactly the same thing about their own society. Next. 
ຄວາມຫນ້າໃນສິກະໄດ້ບອກຊິ Honestly, Mr. President, ហើយយោបលថាអ្វីនឹងត្រូវធ្វើយ៉ាងណាទេប៉ុន្តែអ្វីដែលយើងធ្វើយើងក្នុងគណៈជាមេត្រាវីការពីក្តីយើងនិយ
самом деле утратить экран. Yes, thank you, President. The um, uh, trial chamber is not treating this as um, an objection, um, and uh, it does not wish to uh, interfere with the manner in which Defence Council wishes to present um, its uh, uh, documents or its, its comment on documents, but just to remind um, uh, Defence Council that uh, any comments that are made that are not based on evidence before us or documents before us, of course, have very little weight, very little of any weight, um, Mr. Corby, and I know that you um, understand that. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Cartwright. Um, Mr. President, I have been told by my colleague uh, that I'm fast time to the translation, and so I will slow down the bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Still speaking about this um, revolutionary flag, Ms. President, before um, the objection was made, the co-prosecutors continued to quote in their presentation from the same revolutionary flag, document number B3 slash 11. And they used the following excerpt at ER English 0046-33. Can I have once we make the analysis of the contradiction, contradictions within the Kampuchean society, how did we determine who were the enemies of the revolution and who were the revolutionary forces? There were two enemies who had to be fought. The first was imperialism, particularly American imperialism. The second was the feudal class, the landowners, the reactionary competitors, end of quote. And indeed, the prosecution ended their quote at a convenient location. Because beginning with the very next sentence in this document, it reads as follows, and I quote again. The forces of revolution the were the workers, the peasants, the petty bourgeoisie, the national level capitalists, and the prominent patriots and progressives. We had to gather up whatever forces there were in the national society. We had to gather them up. If we only gathered up a few, we would not succeed in the struggle. If we mobilized only some of them, we would only have succeeded to some extent. If we mobilized all of these forces, we would win completely. If we manage to gather up a large, powerful force, we would win a tremendous victory. This was the factor determining whether we would win or lose. Therefore, we had to know how to gather up the forces of the workers, peasants, petty bourgeoisie, national-level capitalists, and the patriotic personalities. Therefore, how could we mobilize the workers, the peasants, the petty bourgeoisie, the national bourgeoisie, and the prominent patriots? We proceeded according to the line of looking for any major contradictions to be attacked. The major contradictions were with the imperialism and the feudal landlord system, which we had to combat. As for the minor contradictions, they had to be resolved by reciprocal concessions in a way that allowed the unity of all the forces against imperialism, especially American imperialism, and the system of the feudalist landlords and reactionary proprietors. End of quote. 
And Mr. President, the document continues along these lines for the rest of the paragraph, describing the dialogue between these classes and the effort to come to a mutually beneficial position. It's further down the same page, it then makes the following remarkable statement. The pity bourgeoisie and pupils, students, and intellectuals of every kind are allies of the workers and peasants. It was the same in the past, and it is still the same today in the status of the original class. Now, in the next paragraph, even the so-called national level capitalists are described as friends of the revolution. They were not, quote, a fundamental, fundamental force, but they did provide, quote, strategic assistance. And in the next paragraph, after that, even certain elements of the feudal aristocracy, the capitalist class and the landowner class, the core of the group which has seen to oppress the Acted as quote, tactical forces in support of the revolution. And finally, at EIN English 0063 Second, to neutralize those who could be neutralized so that they could not carry out actions against us. Third, to isolate the most vicious in order to protect them. So, Mr. President, Your Honor, if we read all of this together, the revolutionary movement is described as an alliance of a broad cross-section of the Cambodian society against a tiny group of large landowners, which persists in oppressing the peasantry. And even those enemies are, quote, won over or, quote, neutralized where possible. But this is a dramatically different story from the one the prosecution told, which we get by doing something fairly simple, actually reading the whole document. The co-prosecutors pro co then continue to cite from the same document. From the middle of page 40, on the draft transcript until the top uh, of page 43, they quoted a series of excerpts about the use of political and military violence in the course of the revolution between 1968 and 1975. And those are from EIN 0044 now, with respect to these excerpts, we aren't even sure we know what the prosecution's point is. Surely, the prosecution recognizes that armed violence may be used in a civil war. And surely, they recognize that the rebel force has the right to make revolution, especially against foreign invaders and colonialists, which the colonial regime was in every function respect. So, Mr. President, Your Honor, we submit that none of this is relevant at all to any so-called CPK policy. Before leaving this document, I just want to quote the last excerpt the prosecution quotes, because I think that quote strongly supports our client's position. The prosecution's decision to quote it, to quote it as if it were unlawful reflects a failure to think about what any of this actually means. 
มันบานขึ้นอัมปีเอาไว้ชี้ปัจจุบันอังกฤษเอออันคือโซนโซนแซมบีสายบีขมายโซนโซนโซนปรมุยสามมุยหกสบีบารังโซนโซนสายปรมุยมาเพิ่มบีสามสับปีดังนี้ค่ะมิเกปะเดฟายน์ในปี1960ในยุคของชั้นพ่อแม่1 1 to make a national revolution by eradicating the imperialists especially the American imperialists จากกระป๋อนยุ่งเชื่อไปเสียจากกระป๋อนอเมริกัน2 to make democratic revolution by abolishing the reactionary regime of the feudalists and combating capitalism from Cambodian society สักเพุ่มให้กองประดับเรายิ่งตัวสกอลพิจารณาถึงปีนี้ถึงสองเดือนที่ไหนทั่วอิสราเอลโครงการนี้โดยไงที่ดับเบิลปีแคนดิซาชนะปอร์ตจะเป็นตามสมัยก่อน It should be obvious to anyone who reads this with any kind of context that it is not referring to individual American human beings. It's not referring to people who were feudalists and capitalists. It is referring to systems of imperialism and capitalism. It is those systems which were the target of the CPK. And we submit that this is obvious from the language. But any ambiguity is resolved by the last sentence, which states, "We completely realize these two tasks on 17 April 1975." Obviously, the CPK. ในเรื่องของการดำเนินคดีในเรื่องของการดำเนินคดีในเรื่องของการดำเนินคดีในเรื่องของการดำเนินคดีในเรื่องของการดำเนินคดีในเรื่องของการดำเนินคดีในเร
This is a continual struggle between revolution and counter-revolution. It will not stop. Arm yourselves with the stance that the enemy exists, will exist for 10, 20, 30 more years. National people's struggle is like class struggle. In short, the struggle between revolution and counter-revolution will continue. Are they strong or not? This issue does not depend on them, it depends on us. If we take absolute and repeated measures, the enemy will weaken, they will scatter into bits, and the court. Even this excerpt which the prosecution specifically chose to present is in our view innocent. It only warns of, warns of the danger of possible enemies and challenges the people to struggle against it. A little later today, but we want to stress that if you read documents as a whole, it becomes even more apparent just how innocent it is. So we will continue to quote from this document, beginning at the very first sentence after the end of the prosecution's excerpt. I quote again. Sometimes long quotes, Mr. President, I apologize. When we are weak, they are strong. By us being strong, what I want to say is that we have correct views and take correct political and military measures. In a zone, in a sector, in a district, district in a village, or in a cooperative, it is the same. When a cooperative is strong, the enemy cannot enter. But when a cooperative is not strong, the enemy stirs up constant turmoil. Not being strong comes from the cooperative leadership committee not being strong and from the people not being strong. When the leadership committee is strong, the people clearly are strong. The issue depends on whether or not the people understand when educated, whether or not the livelihood of the people can be sorted out. So then, this depends on us, the party, and on the revolution. It does not depend on the enemy. End of quote. But on the next page, Mr. President Jones, this document explains what it means to say that the party can grasp the people. I quote again. The important thing is to take measures, in particular to grasp the cooperatives. The party must grasp the cooperatives. How can the party grasp the cooperatives in the framework of countering the enemy? Grasp them tightly in terms of politics. Make them understand the important political lines of the party. Grasp them ideologically. Make them crystal clear. Each mission of the party, each plan of the party, must be explained to them so that they understand and are crystal clear. Petty dikes, feed the canals, three tons, building the country and defending the country must be explained to them to make them crystal clear. When their understanding is crystal clear, they are pleased. They fight on their own. They have their children and grandchildren join the army, join the mobile units, put up petty dikes and feed the canals. Furthermore, grasp them organizationally, grasp them collectively, and grasp their biographies in turn. Use the forces of the masses in the cooperatives to counter the enemy. The party organization of all the ten corps cannot counter them. When our cooperatives are solid, the enemy cannot enter. That's this. Mr. President, the end of that quote. And again, we apologize for the length of this excerpt. Sometimes we understand it might be hard to follow. But it is exactly our point that these documents can't be understood with the sound bites which the prosecution spent three days feeding the chamber. The documents are very nuanced. And we submit to you that when you read this full excerpt as a whole, the essential point is that if the cooperatives do the work of the, of the revolution well, if they are strong and grasp the people, 
คือเพื่อเอาแค่กองกำลังนึ่งเรื่องม้อมชีชนเรื่องม้อมขมังมันอาจจะโจมบาดเลยทีเดียวดังนั้นเราควรเตรียมตัวต่อไปในการปฏิบัติการเราควรเตรียมตัวต่อไปในการปฏิบัติการเราควรเตรียมตัวต่อไปในการปฏิบัติการเราควรเตรียมตัวต่อไปในการปฏิบัติการเราควรเตรียมตัวต่อไปในการปฏิบัติการปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปีปี Also, this policy is not within the scope of this trial. In case of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so we will deal with these documents in our closing submissions. Let me just make one comment about them. Which is that it seems clear that the language in these documents gets harsher in or around the middle of 1977, and we think that is not surprising. There was a time at which the armed conflict with the Vietnamese was escalating into bouts of full-scale war. That's what happens. In wartime, in countries, but the politicians start saying some vicious things. But it doesn't mean they're working. So I point that out in part as a very preliminary effort to place uh, to place those documents in a context. But also to point out that there is a reason why the June 1976 revolutionary flag sounds different from the May 1978. Revolutionary. The chamber shoot in our submission find that the latter is of no probative value in terms of policies in existence in 1975. Next, Mr. President, the court prosecutors. Presented five documents from the Central Standing Committee. The first is E3/11. It's dated February 1976. This explosion in Simreap, with which the chamber is And all it says is that there is a need to re-educate internal. We don't think. There is anything illegal or criminal about that. So we don't think this shows anything about a so-called criminal policy concerning enemy. The second is E3 slash E3 two. It's the minutes of the March. 1976. It is true that some lower level cadres reported to the committee about some security concerns, but there is no indication of anything unlawful. Just that some suspects have been arrested or interrogated. We don't find it too surprising that there was some general reporting back to the standing committee as a whole about this general subject matter. So we're not sure what the relevance of this particular document is. And the next document, E3 slash 1, 2, 12, Prepared to be a decision of the Central Committee regarding the number of matters. The first one is the right to smash inside and outside the ranks. Uh, Mr. President, I'll make um, two brief comments about this. One is that this document says nothing about any. There is no 
instruction in relation to any person or any group. There's no evidence of any harm being done to anybody. Second, as we see in many of these documents, the word smash is used in a variety of contexts. We're going to discuss that a bit more in just a few moments. Because one of the documents prosecutor it shows it very clearly. But for now, I'll just say that the word smash is a general one. Certainly it does not simply mean kill. The next document, E3-7373, is a June 1978 document from the Central Committee. We're going to skip over this document for now for the same reason we didn't directly address those revolutionaries' flags stated after the middle of 1977. Um, the fifth and final document in the set, E3-79, is a part of from September 1975. And we think, if the chamber reviews uh, this document, you will find nothing even remotely criminal about it. The excerpt cited by the prosecution describes the decline of the codas. The prosecution said that the key language is in the portion of the document which states that when the monkhood is in decline, quote, this special layer of society will no longer cause any worry. We, we, we don't think it is any secret that CPK prefer that monks would participate in society as regular workers and citizens. And there's no hint here of any discriminatory conduct against monks of any kind, nor are monks being described as enemies. Therefore, this document is irrelevant. Now, Mr. President, from this stage onwards, the prosecution's presentation was almost entirely about what this chamber has called questions of implementation. Prosecutors talk about implementation implementation of ministries in the military and security centers. And as you know, we find the presentations of these documents after 20 months of trial, during which everyone accepted that all of this was outside the scope to be just quite incredible. And I suppose we cannot fault the prosecution for trying. We are, however, to say confused about why the chamber let them get away with it. All we can say is that you must now, Mr. President, Your Honours, decide not to consider a single one of the documents during any part of your deliberations. Any other choice would be a flagrant violation of our client's rights. Now there were two documents mixed in here which were within the narrow scope of the existence of the JCE policy. We will talk about those documents. The Chamber can infer that in terms of any document we do not talk about, our position is that those documents are outside the scope of this trial. We won't waste time by listing every single one of them. One of those documents is for instance, a speech given by Paul Pott in April 1976. The document number is E3-818. As usual, the excerpt cited by the co-prosecutors is misleading. Co-prosecutors first quoted the following from ER and English 00436, No matter how well we do things, if the imperialists, imperialists are alive, if the CIA is alive, if their reactionary groups are not yet eliminated from the face of the world, they will continue opposing the revolution, opposing us, opposing anything progressive. Both, both overtly and, and clandestinely, 
uh, the the continues even the its own the terms, uh, this excerpt is obviously just Hong general Dai. political bay the 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 terms, Mr. President, this so excerpt from the Pope's speech is obviously are, just general political rhetoric. But the context of the statement makes it even clearer what this language means and how irrelevant it is. Because the context of the discussion is, is the opposition of other world governments to the CPK regime. The title of the section of the document is The Individual Identities and Reactions Around the World Toward the Establishment of the Government of Democratic Kampuchy. That's on the previous page from the last excerpt. And the document explains uh, how in the early days of the Soviet and the Chinese revolutions, the world cursed them too. And it was only after uh, 10 years, 15 years, and a quote, after the liberation before a number of countries made contacts with China. The forces opposing the CPK revolution are not the internal Congress who must be smashed. They are world public opinion and diplomacy. And the co-prosecutors also chose to meet the final piece and complete the following paragraph. This is normal, end of quote. This is normal, end of quote. In the second excerpt from this document, Pope Pope is quoted as saying, uh, at the revolutionary state authority, fruits of defend the party, the people, the army, Independence, sovereignty against every form of any enemy activity, both overt and covert. We must always be a high revolutionary diligence, always be a mastery. Again, the President is perfectly innocent in the call to ensure that the national defense of the country is protected. Can anyone imagine how badly the state would fail if it did not seek to defend its independence and sovereignty against overt and covert threats? But this perfectly innocent call is made even more in the process by including the portions deliberately and consciously omitted by the prosecution. Because the sentence which immediately follows is this, and I quote, We can be in mastery only when we train or educate the masses in every ministry and office, and in the army, in the cooperatives, in the unions, etc. Therefore, do not think about convenience. Only when the entire masses are absorbed, only when we use the masses as our noses will we be able to defend, to be a master. Thus, Mr. President, Your Honor, as with the two main subjects of the Sixth Revolution, which we discussed earlier, defense comes about through education. And once again, this is nothing at all to do with violence. In the next document, this is a speech of the Prime Minister, given by Pol Pot to the Revolutionary Army of Cambodia in July 1975. The document is number 365. And once again, it's nothing more than an instruction that even though the CPK won the war, they must continue to be vigilant about opponents of the revolution. Now what in this speech does the Constitution complain about exactly? Was it untrue that the mission of the army is to defend the country? Was it untrue that imperialism and colonialism was a continuing threat to Cambodia and to communism in Cambodia? Was it untrue that capitalists and feudalists should expect to resist the communist revolution and seize back state power? Was it untrue that they were likely to use every country? Was it untrue that they were likely to use every country?
Is it criminal to be vigilant uh, uh, in defending the state against both internal and foreign states? And for the Neither is the instruction to smash espionage groups and saboteurs in order to kill anyone. And how do we know that, Mr. President? Because in the very same document, on the very same page, in fact, the very next sentence, immediately following one of the excerpts read out by the Corpus Petitions in Court, the report is quoted as describing the objective of the list in the capitalist as follows. To destroy the revolution, to smash the revolution, to seize state power back from us. Now, unless the meaning of the word smash changed from one sentence to the next, there is no question at all that it was intended to be performed. But the question is, what is it? I'm mindful of the time, Mr. President. I'm going to a last set of documents. I could pause here or um, I could continue to continue The last set of documents, uh, Mr. President, Your Honours, I'm going to make reference to is a long sequence of telegrams. Uh, this was a fairly substantial part of the discussion. It runs from pages 79 through 95, the English language, June 25, draft. Now, most of these documents concern implementation and are outside the scope of this trial. The only reason I refer to them is because some of them report to copy either our line UNCHIA or entities such as Committee 870 or UNCHIA. To the extent that the Chamber concludes that some of these telegrams were intended for UNCHIA, among others, they might be considered relevant to the question of the role. But the subject was uh, covered in more detail the following day on June 27th. And, in fact, I think uh, some of these telegrams were presented again on June 27th and all this will be addressed later by my colleague. So I will move on to the next question. But since the Chamber has made a ហើយជាពិសេសគឺឯកសារត្រូវបានលើកឡើងដោយសាការីរបស់ខ្ញុំគឺនៅក្នុងមណ្ឌាអេកសារទាំងអស់នេះ I think if the chamber has a look at that particular document, you'll see if it doesn't say much about any interest. The next document, which does not copy New and Chia, is dated August 1976. And the next document is from March 1977. So basically, the President and the co-prosecutors were able to find zero documents showing our client's role in relation to any enemies within the particular sections of this specific segment of the trial. The earliest document is almost two full years after the court case, which is the only allegation at issue in this segment of the trial, which concerns an identified enemy. Which concerns an identified enemy. The second point I want to make is that none of these documents they just report to show him receiving some documents. And needless to say, I'm not suggesting that any of this is actually relevant. I'm merely making these two very specific observations. Now, Mr. President, this concludes my one-by-one discussion of the prosecution's documents in relation to the JCE policy on enemies. Um, 
But to complete our response, these documents must be placed in a greater context. In this greater context, with your leave, I would like to uh, describe the process. คุณลูกเมตวีไอลันนี่ดอลเปลสำหรับให้อันแบบการสำหรับมาเพย์เนตีแกเปเปนนี่เตอร์โลดอมองดอกมุ้ยขวาดดอกเนตีส่งมาเ